The Salaf were not bootlickers like you. They want to rip the community apart and cause as much division as possible. Many Madkhalis are agents of governments. There is official documentation recommending the US government secretly fund Madkhalis. My warning to you, Sajid, is that the Madkhalis Brother Sajid Lipham has announced that he is disassociating from me. He has also taken down all the videos on his channel about me. Now, if Brother Sajid wants to disassociate from me, that's his choice. I'm not going to disassociate from him, even though he is really unfair in his accusations against me. Nor will I take down the videos collaborating with him from my channel because that's just not necessary. The truth is I respect Brother Sajid. I appreciate his work and his da'wah. And years ago, at a time when so many compassionate imams and the whole da'wah mafia were attacking me, he was one of the few who publicly defended me. I will never forget that. But I'm worried about my Brother Sajid. So I have to advise him. I also have to warn him. And that warning will come at the end of the video, inshallah. Now, what sparked Sajid's disassociation from me and this attack from a small group of what I have referred to as madkhalis or bootlickers? Muslim Skeptic put out a video denouncing the facilitation of Halloween parties by certain Muslim governments. We simply did our Islamic duty of amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar, enjoining the good and forbidding the evil. For this, we were branded as Kharijis, i.e. Khawarij, by a group commonly known as the Madkhalis. Now, just so we're clear, being called a Khariji or being accused of calling to the path of the Khawarij is a big deal. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in a Sahih Hadith that the Khawarij are the dogs of hellfire. So being called a Khariji is no small accusation. It basically means you're a deviant, but it gets much worse. The thing is, when you label someone a Khariji, you're saying that that person's blood is halal, which means you think that it's permissible for that person to be killed. This is on the basis of a well-known hadith recorded in Sahih Muslim. In the chapter titled Exhortation to Kill the Khawarij, the hadith says, there would arise in the end of times a people who would be young in age and immature in thought, but they would talk as if their words were the best among the creatures. They would recite the Quran, but it would not go beyond their throats, and they would pass through the religion as an arrow goes through prey. So when you meet them, kill them, for in their killing you would get a reward with Allah on the Day of Judgment. This is a very serious hadith, and scholars throughout history say it applies to the Khawarij. So when Madkhalis label someone a Khawariji, they're saying this person should be killed. So after we posted the Saudi Halloween video and the Madkhalis went crazy and blasted me and the Muslim skeptic team as Khawarij, I asked the Madkhalis, do you think our blood is halal? The silence was deafening. None of these Madkhali critics clearly and unambiguously said, no, you should not be killed for criticizing Saudi Halloween. One Madkhali named Wajdi Akkari deflected the answer and said, well, we can't make the decision to kill you. That's up to the ruler. Can you believe that? So if some ruler across the world decides that I should be put to death for doing basic amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar of their Halloween celebrations or their killing of Muslims or their spreading of the kufr, Abrahamic religion doctrine, these madkhalis would have no problem with that. That ruler would be totally justified in killing me. That is what my blood being halal means. So these madkhalis confirm that they think I could be killed at the discretion of the ruler. And furthermore, if I were to be killed by the rulers, no Muslim could raise a peep in disagreement. Otherwise, you're a khariji too and your blood becomes halal too. You might think I'm exaggerating, but on Twitter, some of these madkhalis were even calling for the US government 
to take care of me. Medkhalis are very much in favor of U.S. intelligence and security services. As we'll see later in the video, there's a reason for this. Now, some of you might be confused. How is it possible that just for doing basic Amr bin Ma'roof wa Nahi Anil Munkar about a pagan-inspired Halloween funded by a Muslim government, you could become a dog of hellfire and your blood is halal? Many Muslims who are not well-versed in the issue of rulers and khuruj are confused by this whole controversy with Sajid. Their first exposure to the whole topic was Sajid's video, but sadly, Sajid mixed up several important issues. He also cited a few hadith, but the hadith he cited don't actually support his position. And there's a mountain of other hadith and scholarly statements that Sajid didn't cite that completely debunk his claims. Sajid's video revolved around three separate but related topics. Rebellion against the ruler, obedience to the ruler, criticizing the ruler. The biggest problem with Sajid's video and the Madkhali argument in general is that they conflate these three concepts. They do this because they have the least evidence for the issue of criticizing the ruler. So they strengthen it by mixing in the other two issues which have more evidence to support them. Now, there is no way that I can go through the entire scholarly history of these concepts in one video. But what I can do is give you a basic framework that will help you understand what is at stake in this discussion. A good way to build this framework is to ask a few questions. First, is it allowed to rebel against the Muslim ruler? There is a lot of evidence from the Sunnah as well as statements of ulama that says no. You should not rebel against a Muslim ruler. According to this view, even if the ruler is unjust and he flogs your back and seizes your wealth, you should not rebel against him. Sajid cites a couple of hadith in his video to support this. And just to be absolutely clear, at Muslim Skeptic, we have never encouraged anyone to rebel against their rulers. The second question, should you be obedient to the ruler? Here, there's an important distinction to make. Should you have absolute obedience to the ruler, or should it be a general obedience to the ruler with important exceptions? In the Islamic tradition, everyone agrees that there is general obedience to the Muslim ruler, but this is general obedience, not absolute obedience. For example, if the ruler commands you to worship idols or to stop praying, are you allowed to disobey him? Every scholar says, of course, you can disobey the ruler if the ruler commands you to disobey Allah. This is a principle given by the Prophet ﷺ. He said, there is no obedience to anyone if it's disobedience to Allah. Verily, obedience is only in good conduct. So no one disagrees that obedience to the ruler is just general obedience, not absolute obedience. And again, just to be clear, at Muslim Skeptic, we've never encouraged anyone to disobey the rulers. In fact, we have stated multiple times on our channels that we urge everyone to obey the law. Obeying the law means obeying the ruler. Now, to be more specific, there are two specific types of disobeying the ruler that the scholars of Islam have permitted. What if a ruler creates a law that says no one is allowed to preach Islam and no one is allowed to do da'wah? Are we supposed to obey the ruler in this? The ulama said, no, of course not. We are obligated to teach Islam and spread it, even if that means disobeying the ruler. Two examples of this in history are Imam Ahmad and Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. In the case of Imam Ahmad, he was told by the Mu'tazila, ruler in his time, to stop teaching that the Qur'an is uncreated. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, refused to obey the ruler and continued to teach the correct position. 
for this disobedience to the ruler, he was put into prison. Another example is Ibn Taymiyyah, who was also told by the ruler to stop teaching that three talaqs count as one. Ibn Taymiyyah refused this order from the ruler and continued to teach what he believed to be the correct position while also criticizing the government-backed scholars who were teaching the contrary view. Ibn Taymiyyah also ended up in prison for his refusal to remain silent. So da'wah and teaching deen properly is one well-known case where scholars agreed that it's permissible to publicly go against the ruler. The other case is known as inkar, or condemnation of the munkar, or condemnation of evil. We know from numerous verses of the Qur'an and hadith that we're all responsible for amr bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar, enjoining good and forbidding evil. The scholars are unanimous that there is no obedience to a ruler who tells you to stop doing this Islamic duty. If a ruler tells you to stop publicly enjoining good and forbidding evil, you do not have to obey him in that. There are many proofs of this from the Qur'an and Sunnah, but just as a simple example, consider the famous hadith collection of Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim titled one section of his collection Wujubul Inkar, which means the obligation to denounce specifically the obligation to denounce the rulers when they contradict the sharia. In other words, there is a necessity to denounce the rulers when they contradict the sharia, wujub al-inkar, the necessity of that. Imam Muslim then cites this very important hadith where the Prophet wasallam said, rulers will be appointed over you and you will find them doing good as well as bad deeds. Anyone who hates their bad deeds is absolved from blame. Anyone who condemns their bad deeds is also safe. But anyone who approves of their bad deeds and imitates them is doomed. People asked, Messenger of Allah, should we not fight against them? He replied, no, as long as they offer salah. So we see from this hadith that the Prophet ﷺ explicitly mentions inkar, which means to denounce or condemn. Notice how the Prophet ﷺ distinguishes condemning these rulers versus fighting them. This matches our common sense understanding. Just because you condemn something, that doesn't mean you're calling for a war or rebellion. If condemning something in and of itself necessitated rebellion or inevitably led to rebellion, then the Prophet ﷺ telling us to condemn the evil of the rulers would mean that he was encouraging rebellion. But that would contradict the fact that he says later in the hadith, don't fight them as long as they pray. Now when the Prophet ﷺ says, inkar, what does he mean by that? What are the conditions for inkar? Does it include public criticism of the ruler? To better understand the nature of the inkar that this hadith refers to, we need to dig deeper. Now, when this hadith about inkar is cited, the madkhalis have a ready-made response. They say, yeah, of course we agree. The ruler should be corrected when he makes a mistake, but the ruler should be advised privately, not publicly. As evidence for this claim, they cite the following hadith found in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, where the Prophet ﷺ is reported to have said, Whoever intends to advise one with authority on a matter, he should not do so publicly. Rather, he should take him by the hand and advise him in private. If he accepts the advice, all is well. If he does not accept it, he has fulfilled his duty. Madkhalis spam this hadith on social media, pretending like this is a knockdown proof of their position. But the problem is, they're stretching the hadith to mean something that it does not mean. Many ulama have commented on this exact hadith, and they say that this hadith does not nullify the default principle. The default principle that it's permissible to publicly oppose the ruler whenever he violates Islam. That is the default principle, and this hadith is simply saying, if possible to privately advise the ruler, 
then it's better to do so. But if it's not possible to privately advise the ruler, then the default permissibility to publicly do inkar still stands. This interpretation of the hadith is supported by the actions of the Sahaba and the righteous Salaf who engaged in public criticism of rulers. The famous example is that of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, one of the great companions who says the following in a Sahih narration collected in Bukhari. The Prophet وسلم, used to proceed to the Musalla on the days of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. The first thing to begin with was the prayer and after that he would stand in front of the people and the people would keep sitting in the rows. Then he would preach to them, advise them and give them orders, i.e. in the khutbah. The people followed this tradition till I went out with Marwan, the governor of Medina, for the prayer of Eid al-Adha or Eid al-Fitr. When we reached the Musalla, there was a pulpit made by Kathir ibn Salt. Marwan wanted to get up on that pulpit before the prayer. I got a hold of his clothes, but he pulled them and ascended the pulpit and delivered the khutbah before the prayer. I said to him, by Allah, you have changed the Prophet's tradition. He replied, O oh, Abu Sa'id, gone is that which you know. I said, by Allah, what I know is better than what I do not know. Marwan said, people do not sit to listen to our khutbah after the prayer, so I delivered the khutbah before the prayer. We see that Abu Sa'id radiallahu anhu is publicly criticizing the ruler and even grabbing the ruler to correct him in front of everyone there for Eid Salah. Abu Sa'id did not wait till after the Eid Salah was over to take the ruler aside and privately advise him. Did this action from Abu Sa'id al-Khudri mean that he was a khariji? Another example is recorded in Sahih Muslim. Ka'ab ibn Ujra narrates that he entered the mosque and saw Abd Rahman ibn Umm Hakam delivering the sermon while he was seated. Upon this, he said, look at this wretched person. He delivers the sermon while sitting, whereas Allah says in Surah Al-Jum'ah, but on one occasion when they saw a transaction or a diversion, O Muhammad, they rushed to it and left you standing. So this Abd Rahman was the governor in power and the Sahabi Ka'b ibn Ujra not only criticized him publicly at the masjid, he even insulted him by calling him Khabith, which can be translated as wretched or disgusting. So this was not private advice, it was public criticism of the ruler in particular. Despite this public inkar of the ruler, no one ever claimed that Ka'b ibn Ujra was a khariji or was inciting rebellion or that he did something wrong, let alone something that made him a deviant. So there are many other examples from the Sahaba and the Salaf who publicly criticized the ruler, sometimes even insulting the ruler. Were these Sahaba ignorant of the statement of the Prophet wasallam to advise the ruler in private? Or did they deliberately disobey the Prophet ﷺ? Now, I wouldn't put it past some of these bootlickers to actually call the Sahaba ignorant or disobedient. But let's see how some major scholars interpreted this hadith about advising the rulers in private. In the commentary on Sahih Muslim, Imam Nawawi rahimahullah says that advising in private is preferable. But publicly criticizing the ruler can be done if advising in private is not possible. He says, quote, if it's not possible to admonish and refute the rulers in private, let him do this in public so that the basic public rights are not lost. Imam al-Ghazali says the same thing in his Ihya Ulum al-Din, as Bro Haji notes in a recent video on his channel. Ibn Taymiyyah also has the same interpretation and what is significant is that Shaykh al-Islam puts his position into practice. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, lived under the Mamluk government which ruled over Egypt and Syria. Although Ibn Taymiyyah did not encourage armed rebellion against the Mamluk government, he did verbally criticize the government and its policies. Moreover, he disobeyed the government when it demanded that he stop speaking out in this way. This behavior led to Ibn Taymiyyah being imprisoned multiple times. Consider the following two famous events from his life. The Mamluk government held a particular view on divorce. The government had the view that a husband could not pronounce three divorces at one time, thereby dissolving the marriage irrevocably. 
The government insisted that society adopt this view of divorce. However, Ibn Taymiyyah rejects this view, insisting that three divorces pronounced at one time only count as one divorce and do not dissolve the marriage irrevocably. The government ordered Ibn Taymiyyah to stop preaching this view and to stop challenging the official view of the state. However, Ibn Taymiyyah persisted in preaching his view for which he was jailed for six months. In another case, a well-connected Christian had insulted the Prophet وسلم, thereby incurring the Sharia penalty of death. However, the Mamluk government in Damascus wanted to avoid applying the punishment. In response, Ibn Taymiyyah joined a crowd to protest the governor's behavior. The governor responded by having Ibn Taymiyyah confined and beaten. So these are two famous examples of Ibn Taymiyyah challenging the rulers, criticizing them, protesting them, and disobeying their official orders. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah did for his own ruler, but he went much further in criticizing the rulers of other governments. He harshly criticized the Mongol government that was led by the Muslim convert Ghazan Khan. He attacked this ruler for not applying the Sharia and instead applying Mongol customary law in place of the Sharia. On these grounds, he even took things a step further by publicly calling for jihad against the Mongols. So this is the example of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. But there are so many more examples. We could talk about how some of the Sahaba publicly had disagreements with the ruler of their time like Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. We can talk about the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Hussein, and his public opposition to Yazid. We can talk about how the four great Imams, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam al-Shafi, Imam Ahmed, all had public disputes with the rulers of their times and faced severe consequences and sometimes torture and imprisonment for their oppositional stance. The point is, there are countless examples, and this video would be 10 hours long if we detailed all their stories. But for the sake of time, let's look at what contemporary ulama say, specifically the ulama that we know Brother Sajid and the Madakhila respect. Now, I will leave all the citations in the description below, but consider Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah. The Sheikh was explicitly asked about the hadith of advising rulers in private. In response, the Sheikh says very clearly, quote, There is no doubt that denouncing evil is a duty for everyone who is able to do it, as Allah says, and let there be from you a nation inviting to all that is good, enjoining what is right, and forbidding what is wrong, and those will be the successful. There is also the ayah, Cursed are those who disbelieved from the children of Israel through David and Jesus son of Mary for their disobedience and transgression. They did not forbid evil that they did. But we must know that these Islamic imperatives in such matters have different applications under different circumstances and wisdom must be utilized. So when to denounce publicly? Answer, when the interest of ridding evil and establishing good is served. Otherwise, if this interest cannot be served by public denunciation, it should be done privately. Basically, the Sheikh is saying exactly what the other ulama of the past said. Inkar can be verbal and public. If you can advise privately, go ahead and do that. That might be better in certain circumstances. But if the ultimate interests or the maslaha can be served through public inkar and private advice is not possible, then public inkar is permissible and in some cases it might even be preferable. Another major scholar of the 20th century, Sheikh Ibn Baz, rahimahullah, says the same thing in his fatwa. Quote, the basic rule is that the one doing inkar has to consider what is the best option and what is going to get the most success. What works with one ruler might not work with another ruler. Therefore, the Muslim who is giving advice should consider the factors that will lead to success. If giving advice publicly is welcomed, as in the story of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, then that's fine. However, if the inkar is for sensitive matters and he fears that it won't be accepted from him, or there will be a bad consequence, then he should do what is best. If he were in a place or a country with someone and he feels that the best option is to do inkar of that person with his tongue in public, then he should do so. 
and he should take into account the best option as people vary in these issues. Therefore, if he feels that it is not the best option to do it in public and that he can write or talk to him privately instead, then he should do so because these matters differ based on everyone's circumstances. Also, this person should keep everything private as much as he can, give him a visit, write to him, and if he feels that the best thing to do is to do inkar publicly, and he says, so-and-so did such-and-such, such, yet the private advice did not work with him, and he felt that doing this in public is going to be useful, then he should do so. So, Sheikh bin Baz, rahimahullah, is saying the exact same thing. There is a case-by-case -case basis to things, but sometimes public condemnation of the ruler may be necessary. Finally, there is Shaykh al-Albani, who was asked about the hadith of advising the ruler in private and whether that hadith contradicts the story of Abu Sa'id, criticizing the governor in public. In response, Shaykh al-Albani says, if the ruler openly violates the sharia, then publicly denouncing him does not violate the sharia. Because those who hear about the violation from the ruler, and his violation is a munkar or an evil, then that evil will enter into their hearts, unless the scholar denounces that violation of the ruler. This is the apparent meaning of the hadith of Abu Sa'id. But this does not contradict the principle that was mentioned in the letter, i.e. about private advice. Not only does Sheikh al-Albani acknowledge that public criticism of rulers is allowed, it might even be necessary in order to prevent people from becoming misguided because the scholars are being silent in the face of public violations of the deen. So there is no contradiction with this and the hadith about advising the ruler in private. Because if that is the best option, then sure, go ahead and advise in private. But if it's not possible, or the chance of evil and misguidance spreading is greater, then public criticism is also allowed or may even be preferable. Sheikh al-Albani actually practiced this himself. Towards the end of his life, the Sheikh lived in Jordan and he publicly criticized the Saudi government for their role in the Gulf War against Iraq. <laughs> أن جذب السعوديين والحق حقا يقال جذب السعوديين أو الحكومة السعودية للصليبيين إلى بلادهم وباختيارهم هو شر أكبر من اعتداء العراقيين على الكويت هذا قلته أكثر مرة والآن أختم هذه الجلسة بهذه الكلمة كما أن حزب البعث العراقي لا يمثل الشعب العراقي كذلك الدولة السعودية لا تمثل الشعب السعودي بمن فيهم من آل العلم والفضل والصلاح والتقوى فسياسة الدول أو الحكومات العربية اليوم لا تلتقي مع رغبات الشعوب المسلمة وأقول مثالا لا يختلف في مشايخ السعوديين اليوم انتشار التماثيل والصور في الدوائر الحكومية التي هذا الانتشار الذي ينافي دعوة التوحيد وينافي ما كان يقوله ولا يزال يقوله رجال التوحيد فهذا كله يمثل أن الدولة في كل الشعوب الإسلامية لا تمثل شعوبها لكن مع هذا أقول مع أن جل الصليبيين إلى البلاد السعودية شر من اعتداء حزب البعث على الكويت فهذا الاعتداء من ثماره ذاك الجلب أي اعتداء الحكومة العراقية على الكويت هي السبب في جلب هذه المصيبة الكبرى وهي الاستعانة بالكفار وجلبهم إلى بلاد الإسلام وكنت أقرب هذه الحقيقة بمثل عربي قديم قال الحائط للوتد لما تشق لي قال سل من يذقني this is harsh public condemnation from Sheikh al-Albani of a particular Muslim government. Sheikh al-Albani didn't make this condemnation privately, nor did he do it in the presence of the ruler. He did it publicly, hundreds of miles away from the ruler he was criticizing. Does Sajid consider Sheikh al-Albani a khariji or an insider of rebellion? المسلمين في العراق 
في القنابل المدمرة تتعاون مع الأمريكان اليهود واليهود الذين استولوا على فلسطين لمساعدة البريطانيين والأمريكيين أصبح من آثار استجلاب الكفار إلى بلاد السعودية أن يقاتل السعوديون معهم المسلمين وهذه يعني مصيبة الشهر There are many other statements as well from all of these shuyukh where they harshly criticized and sometimes even made takfir of certain rulers, like the Ba'athist Arab dictators like Hafiz al-Assad. If we applied the Madkhali logic consistently, all these top ulama would be considered khawarij. There is one other important thing that Madkhali say, so we should preemptively refute it. They say you can't criticize the ruler if he is not physically present. If you want to do inkar, the ruler has to be there. As we saw though, this condition was not stipulated in the fatawa from any of the shuyukh we've mentioned. And as we saw, Sheikh al-Albani himself was criticizing Saudi rulers publicly, but not in the presence of the rulers themselves. As a last resort, the Madkhalis will say, well, if you criticize the ruler when he's not present, that is backbiting, that's ghiba. This is just nonsense, pure and simple. Many of the Imams of the Salaf have noted that one of the well-known exceptions to the prohibition of backbiting is criticizing an evil ruler. A couple of brothers have compiled statements from the scholars of the Salaf, including Sufyan ibn Uyayna and Yahya ibn Abi Kathir, who said that there is nothing sinful about criticizing an oppressive ruler behind his back. So the summary of all this is that many scholars said there's no problem criticizing a ruler publicly or privately, in his presence or behind his back. This proves that when the Madkhali say that all the scholars agree that you cannot publicly criticize the ruler, they are straight up lying. This is a blatant lie and even their own shuyukh do not agree on that position. All they're doing is pretending like they have the same positions as major scholars like Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Bin Baz, Sheikh Al Albani, when in reality those ulama, plus Imam Nawawi, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah, and many others, fully contradict the Madkhali view, not only in their explicit teaching on the relevant hadith and in their fatawa, but also in their own public actions, criticizing the rulers of their time. Madkhalis have to pretend none of this material exists. And when you bring this textual and audio evidence to them, they quickly run away or make some excuse or some bizarre interpretation. This shows the utter lack of integrity and intellectual honesty from this group. So that's a lot of information, but let's zoom out a bit to get a better picture of the whole issue and put our finger on exactly the core problem that the Madkhalis have with me and Muslim skeptic. The Madkhalis say, do not rebel against the ruler. Muslim skeptic says, do not rebel against the ruler. The Madkhalis say, you should obey the ruler. Muslim skeptic says, you should obey the ruler. The Madkhalis say, Advise the ruler in private. Muslim skeptic says, yes, advise the ruler in private if possible. But if it's not possible, then it's permissible to do it publicly in order to serve the greater good. That's it. That's the only difference that is causing these Madkhalis to denounce us as deviants and declare that we are khawarij, dogs of hellfire, and that our blood is halal. And that is really what it means to be a bootlicker. That is what I am referring to when I use the term bootlicker. A bootlicker is not someone who says, don't do khuruj, or don't do takfir, or don't disobey the ruler. That's not what makes someone a bootlicker. Because all of those positions are represented in the scholarly tradition. A bootlicker, on the other hand, says, don't you dare ever do amr bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar against the ruler publicly. Don't you dare shut your mouth no matter what kind of evil and kufr and dhulm the ruler does. <laughs> Sorry, akhi, you are a bootlicker. 
And there is no one from the Salaf who share your deviated view. Yes, there were Salaf who remained silent in the face of the Munkar of the ruler, and other Salaf who loudly and openly denounced the ruler for that Munkar. But the first group never told the second group to shut up, shut your mouth. The Salaf were not bootlickers like you. When we look at the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the statements of the Salaf, the statements of the Khalaf, and the Fatawa of the senior ulama, past and present, there is so much evidence that agrees with our position and contradicts the view of the Madkhalis and bootlickers. Now, there is one other loose end that we should address. In his video, Sajid implies that I have made blanket takfir against rulers. As proof of this, he takes two separate statements I have made in separate contexts, and he brings these statements together as proof that I'm doing blanket takfir and inciting rebellion against Muslim rulers. The first statement I have made is that no Muslim country today fully applies Sharia. The second statement is that not ruling by the Sharia makes one a kafir. Sajid combines these two statements to claim that I am making blanket takfir on all rulers today. But this is not fair. I made each of these statements in a particular context, and I have never made the blanket takfir that Sajid is accusing me of making. As for the statement that no country applies Sharia 100%, that's obviously true, and I dare Sajid to deny it. Sadly, Muslim countries have been ravished by colonialism and military pressure applied by Western states. For that reason, such societies do not and are not permitted to apply the full range of Sharia rules. This does not mean that they do not apply some Sharia rules or teachings or that their population and their rulers have categorically rejected the Sharia. In stating that no Muslim land applies the full range of Sharia, I am simply stating a universally recognized fact. As for the statement that not applying the Sharia makes one a kafir, that is simply what Allah says in the Quran. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then those are truly the disbelievers. Now this is a clear-cut verse that no Muslim can deny. But of course, that doesn't mean we can apply this verse willy-nilly. Rather, applying this verse has many important nuances that an unqualified person like me is not in a position to exercise. But my point is, I have never claimed that whoever does not rule 100% by the Sharia is automatically a kafir. Rather, as I've stated explicitly, there are complex contextual factors to take into account, which is why I have said explicitly on many occasions, leave the takfir to the qualified scholars. We're not going to make takfir and say, okay, this ruler is a kafir, this ruler is a kafir. Uh, people might have a problem. <laughs> the other side is going to have a problem with that as well. Uh, we'll just leave it like because we're just, we're lay people. We're not scholars. We have no authority. So there's no reason for us to go to that extent, but we just... Uh, affirm in no unclear terms that if you're going to abolish the Sharia of Allah, you're going to enforce secularism, you're going to put social policies into place that are literally taking Muslims out of Islam step by step and destroying the next generation of Muslims, this is kufr. This is kufr. We're going to be clear cut about that. So one side will say, oh, you're takfiri. Uh, and the other side will say say that, oh, well, you're uh, murji, you're, you're doing irjat. Because you're not going and specifically saying this is this is a kafir, this is a kafir, this is a kafir. So Allahu alam, you know that's just my you know understanding in in a quick nutshell. But there's a lot of tafsir. Sajid apparently has missed all those statements. So hopefully he will take note of what I'm saying in this video so that he can stop misrepresenting me in the future. Now that we've debunked Sajid's claims, let's move on to another major issue. Many Madkhalis are agents of governments. This is why they're rightfully considered bootlickers. 
I'm not saying that every madkhali is a government agent. I'm not saying that Sajid is a government agent. But clearly, some of these madkhalis are working for certain agencies. And there's a lot of proof for this. But before looking at the proof, let's consider some of the primary characteristics of the madkhalis and how they operate online. Number one, they work hard to block any criticism of the secular rulers in the Muslim world. Number two, they legitimate the killing of Muslims who criticize the secular rulers. This is why the Madkhalis love using the word Khawarij or Khariji. They use the word Khawarij because they know that that makes a person's blood halal. It justifies killing. The Madkhalis could say, hey Daniel, you're criticizing the ruler because you're a jahil or you're a deviant. But they don't do that. They always have to add the label Khariji or Khawarij. This is precisely for the purpose of Islamically legitimizing lethal actions by secular tyrants against their Muslim critics. Also, Madkhali's focus on the secondary and tertiary issues of deen and not the usul. This is again deliberate. They want to rip the community apart and cause as much division as possible. Disagreeing with other Muslims is not enough for them. They have to disassociate and boycott. Sajid, for example, could have easily said, look, I have a difference of opinion with Daniel on this minor issue and left it at that. But no, Sajid has to go back and delete any video with me and make this huge spectacle of washing his hands clean of me. Did I violate some major principle of the deen? Did I innovate an entirely new position in Islam? Or did I distort the deen for the sake of selling out? Did I call for reforming Islam? No, but it doesn't matter for Madkhalis. What matters to them is putting the issue of criticizing the ruler at the center of their aqidah and then making their entire da'wah about attacking whoever doesn't agree on this one issue. The other characteristic of Madkhalis is that whenever they see Muslims collaborating across different madahib or manahij, they quickly attack that. This is part of their strategy to create as much division between orthodox, traditional Muslims as possible. Another characteristic is that they will not agree to debate. They are fine typing up tweet after tweet, but if you challenge them to a debate or to discuss issues openly, they reject those offers. The thing is, this particular combination of traits is unprecedented in Islamic history. These traits combined are unique to the Madkhalis. And the reason is the Madkhalis are a product of intelligence agencies. Their cult has been designed by intelligence agencies as a kind of a virus with the purpose of causing as much division and infighting amongst conservative Sunni Muslims as possible. Part of the proof for this is that there is official documentation recommending the U.S. government secretly fund Madkhalis. Consider the figure of Jarrett Brackman, a high-level U.S. counterterrorism official affiliated with the CIA who also served as director of research at West Point's Combating Terrorism Center. West Point is the top U.S. military academy training its army officers. In his book, Global Jihadism, page 29, Brackman explains the U.S. military's understanding of who exactly the Madkhalis are. Quote, Arab states have generally viewed the Madkhali Salafists as palatable, much like the establishment Salafists, given their endorsement of secular and democratic forms of government and their unflinching support for local Arab regimes. With Saudi backing the Madkhalis have firmly entrenched themselves globally, operating out of most Western countries. They have also gone online, so Muslims anywhere around the world can download Madkhalis teachings. In Saudi Arabia, members of the group are more commonly referred to as Jamis and are known for their hostility to any political tendency that opposes the authorities. What this is saying is that authorities in the Gulf fund and install the Madkhalis on a global scale. But there is more. 
West Point produces strategic recommendations for U.S. military and national security. In a report published in 2006 titled Stealing Al-Qaeda's Playbook, the authors make a very interesting recommendation to counter radical jihad. Quote, the United States should very carefully and unobtrusively support Muslim religious leaders and movements that can effectively compete with the jihadi movement in terms of mass appeal and popularity among the youth. Naturally, many of the most effective competitors will not be friendly to the United States and the West, but if the bottom line is a rejection of violence against the United States and its allies, they should be supported. The difficulty comes in identifying the right leader or group. The U.S. could discreetly fund mainstream Salafi figures like Madkhali, who are effective in siphoning off support from jihadis, and figures who do not advocate violence, for example, by paying for publications, lectures, new schools. This will be effective in the short term. Again, it is essential that the U.S. hand not be seen. The U.S. government is using the word jihadi to refer to any Muslim who supports political Islam. Any Muslim who wants to live in a country ruled by the Sharia, as opposed to liberal secularism, is considered an extremist and a threat by the U.S. government and its secular allies in the Muslim world. Therefore, the strategic recommendation from U.S. counter-extremism officials is to support and secretly fund the Madkhalis, as we just read. And it makes sense. The U.S. needs to keep secular tyrants in full control. Any kind of criticism of these tyrants will delegitimize those regimes. So they secretly fund Madkhalis to attack any critic of these regimes and spread the view that it is not only haram, but actually a deviance or khuruj to raise a peep against any ruler. The behavior of Madkhalis makes it very apparent that they are agents. Let's briefly consider one example. One of the main English-speaking Madkhalis on social media is Faris al-Hamadi. As recently as 2015, Hamadi was just a gym owner in Dubai who coached people on CrossFit. For some years, his content was mainly in the Arabic language. But for some reason, five years ago, he suddenly started making videos in English and posting TikTok videos aimed at English-speaking Muslims, teaching them basic things like how to make wudu or how to pray. What's interesting is that intermixed with his videos about how to make wudu, Hamadi throws in a video about the top four khawarij of our times and how the best thing the ruler of the UAE ever did was throw the Muslim Brotherhood in prison. In a 2020 interview, Dawaman introduces Faris by saying he worked for the government and was involved with, quote, training other governments. 14 years experience in the corporate world. He does training workshops uh, as a part of a government program um, for other uh, countries' governments, for other uh, countries' governments. It is not clear what Ferris was training governments in. A lot of questions can be asked about Hamadi and his connection to the UAE government but we won't get into all the details for this video. But a good sample to see exactly what Faris al-Hamadi is all about is how he dedicates a whole video to brazenly promoting the normalization of ties between Israel and the UAE. About the normalization, the treaty that happened between the UAE and Israel. Treaties and relationships, political relationships with one country to another, this is the responsibility of not us, of the ruler. He is referring to the Abraham Accords, which we know is a pure Zionist product designed to put Muslims under the boot of Israel. Brothers and sisters, consider this, and this is very important. Don't let your emotions control you. Emotions don't drive and create facts. These big complex matters, this is like I said, it's not up to us to discuss and analyze and give opinions on. As far as Islam is concerned, normalization with the Jews is actually permissible and it's actually the responsibility of the ruler. He sees whether this is beneficial 
or not. This is how this agent throws our Palestinian brothers and sisters under the bus in order to deflect criticism from his masters in the UAE. It is absolutely disgusting, but he doesn't even stop there. How do Palestinians handle betrayal of Saudi and UAE with Israel? There is no betrayal. We're supporting Palestinians all the way. The betrayal is happening from the Palestinians themselves, actually. Sorry. The betrayal is happening from the Palestinians themselves, actually. Sorry. In this short video that Hamadi uploaded, he is asked how Palestinians handle the betrayal of the Saudi and UAE governments in their diplomatic and economic partnership with Israel. This smug agent smiles through his teeth and says, Saudi and UAE support Palestine, but the betrayal is coming from Palestinians. <laughs> How did the Palestinians betray Saudi and UAE, Faris? Did they betray you by getting bombed? Did they betray you by getting their children murdered and their homes destroyed? How exactly did the Palestinians betray you, Faris? How did they betray Saudi and the UAE? Please explain that for us. Interestingly, Hamadi has a special obsession with me and our brother Mohammed Hijab. He has dedicated numerous videos and tweets to calling us out as deviants and khawarij. He claims we are deviants because we engage in debates. Debating against liberalism, feminism, and secularism is somehow deviance for Ferris. He also claims that by criticizing Middle Eastern governments, I am inciting rebellion against rulers. Therefore, I'm a Khariji. Now, what is so ironic is that Hamadi has been far more involved with inciting rebellion than anything I have ever said. In 2013, immediately before the coup in Egypt, Hamadi was tweeting against the ruler of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, and calling for him to be removed. After the coup, Hamadi was celebrating. And in 2016, Hamadi was also tweeting against Erdogan, the ruler of Turkey, right after the coup attempt that happened in Turkey in 2016. Isn't it interesting how Hamadi is in the UAE and he's always praising the rulers in the UAE and the UAE government and he just happens to be agitating against the UAE's geopolitical enemies like Turkey and Mohammed Morsi of Egypt? Isn't it interesting how Hamadi is so conveniently tweeting this incitement to rebellion right around the time that these coups actually happened? Nothing shady about any of that. But the point is, for someone who supposedly is so worried about rebellion and is so opposed to any and all forms of criticism of the ruler, Hamadi sure has done a lot of exactly that. He just has done it in a selective fashion. Criticizing the Gulf rulers is khuruj, but criticizing the rulers of Turkey and Egypt? That's fine. This is typical of the Medkhalis. Their hypocrisy and double standards on criticizing rulers is well known. Consider this active Madkhali, Wajdi Akkari. Wajdi has dedicated multiple videos to attacking me, calling me a deviant Khariji because I criticize rulers, but Akkari has no problem featuring Faris Hamadi on his channel, who has gone way farther than me in calling for the removal of governments and removal of rulers. So why doesn't Akari delete his video with Hamadi and denounce Hamadi as a deviant Khariji? Why the double standard, Wajdi? Hamas is a, is a Hizb, is a cult of people uh, that, uh, that conspire and work along with the Shia and they work along with the Ikhwan and Muslimin, and they work, work, uh, work along with, uh, with any type of nonsense. Sheikh Al-Albani said, uh, he says about the movement, it's not an Islamic movement whether you like it or not. Wow, Wajdi. 
That sounds an awful lot like criticizing the rulers. Isn't Hamas the rulers in Gaza, in Palestine? Aren't they Muslims? Are you criticizing them in this kind of way? Doesn't that mean you're inciting khuruj and rebellion and bloodshed? Have you no shame? Another example is a good friend of Sajid named Omar Shatila. Shatila is like the Madkhali police on Twitter. He will dedicate hundreds of tweets debating with random no-name accounts to defend his Madkhali cult ideology, spreading all kinds of nonsense that he knows the average Muslim doesn't have enough knowledge to refute. Recently, Shatila violated his own manhaj by publicly criticizing Saudi and saying it does not implement Sharia 100%. Isn't this inciting takfir against the Saudi rulers, Shatila? Aren't you inciting rebellion against the Saudi government? Some of his fellow bootlickers attacked Omar Shatila because Shatila was defending an Egyptian scholar, Sheikh Abu Ishaq al Huwaini. You can see the bootlickers are outraged. How can you support Huwaini when he sits with the Khawarij and the Ikhwan? Shatila tries his best to defend the sheikh, but the evidence is overwhelming that the sheikh is not on the bootlicking menhaj. So in his desperation to defend Sheikh al Hawaini, Shatila says that he doesn't believe all ikhwan are khawarij, which is basically a statement of blasphemy as far as bootlickers are concerned. Shatila even goes one step further and says that supporting protests does not make a person a khariji or a deviant. Again, this is like a statement of pure blasphemy for bootlickers, which is why they have put Shatila on notice. But putting bootlicker infighting aside for a moment, just think about the logic here from Shatila. According to Omar Shatila, if you criticize Saudi Halloween, you are inciting rebellion, which means you are on the path of the Khawarij and outside of Ahl Sunnah. But if you think protesting in the streets against the rulers is permissible, that does not make you a deviant outside of Ahl Sunnah. That means that going out on the street and protesting a ruler is less of an incitement to rebellion than making a video against Saudi Halloween thousands of miles away. Wow, that makes a lot of sense, Omar. One thing we'll have to keep in mind about the Madkhalis is that they have long beards, they wear thobes, they give this aura of authenticity and authority. But then when you follow them, you realize that their whole message is about not criticizing the Gulf rulers. That's really what their entire dawah is all about. That's the main meat of their dawah and everything else is just window dressing. It's like the whole facade is to attract conservative Muslims, but the main message is blindly submit to the secular rulers. For those of you paying attention, this is exactly like the compassionate imams and the crypto reformers, the same exact dynamic. They draw in conservative Muslims with their talk of Quran and Sunnah and the scholarly tradition. But then when you listen to them more carefully, you realize that their whole message is feminism and liberalism and democracy and watering down the deen to appease the Western standard. Now, I also mentioned that the Madkhalis are like a virus designed to cause as much division as possible. Let me substantiate that for you. Overall, the whole purpose of Madkhaliism is to neutralize conservative Sunni Muslims who don't want to see the Muslim world secularized and dominated by secular Western powers and Israel. The main tactic for neutralizing Sunni Muslims is to divide them and embroil them in infighting. This strategy was explicitly outlined by the Yanon plan in the 80s, talking about Israeli strategy to dominate Muslims, and more famously by RAND, the highly influential think tank that advises US policy. On page 62 through 64 of RAND's Civil Democratic Islam, Rand lays out a strategy to create division between traditionalists, i.e. medhabis, medhab following Muslims, and fundamentalists, i.e. Salafis. Rand identifies that the biggest threat to the Western agenda is if conservative Orthodox Sunni Muslims unite. So their strategy is to generate as much division as possible, driving a wedge between madhab-oriented traditional Sunnis and Salafis is critical for their goals. They say this explicitly. 
As I have said publicly before, Muslim skeptic aims to unite on the basis of orthodox Islam against liberalism. In a recent article published on Muslim skeptic, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Torefi is quoted, the greatest reason for the failure and loss of courage and defeat of the Ummah is disputing in the subsidiary issues of deen in a time when there is an attack on the foundations of Islam. Against this, you find the Medkhalis, who we should really call the Rand Khalis because they follow the Rand agenda to the letter. While the enemies of Islam are doing their best to destroy Islam, to reform Islam, to liberalize Islam, Rand Khalis are going around targeting conservative Sunnis, the exact people who are working so hard to defend the deen from these influences. A recent example of this was when I made statements praising the Diobandi movement and appreciating their continued service to the Ummah, their leadership in producing more Hufav and more Ulama than any other Islamic institution in the world, appreciating their senior Ulama who are well known to be models of Sunnah and piety and knowledge. I simply express my appreciation and love for these upholders of deen and my desire to ally and work with them and benefit from their knowledge. And what do the Rand Khalis do? They immediately start attacking me. Are these Madkhalis so ignorant of history that they don't realize that the ulama across Manahij would always ally together to unite in order to fight the enemies of Islam? Are they ignorant that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, who was an Athari by the way, supported and fought alongside Ash'aris and Maturidis against the looming threat from the invading Mongol forces? This unity didn't mean ignoring differences or saying differences don't matter. Unity meant recognizing that there is a much bigger problem right now that if not addressed will destroy everyone and will wipe out Islam off the face of the earth. But the Rand Khalis work hard to attack any form of Muslim unity. Another example, you will notice that they aggressively campaign against anyone who calls for Khilafah. Khilafah just means uniting Muslims under one political banner, uniting Muslims in one ummah. How can any Muslim be against this? But you see the Madkhalis attacking anyone who wants Khilafah. It's almost like these Madkhalis want Muslims to be weak and divided as possible. They want Muslims separated into these small nations ruled over by secular tyrants who only answer to the US and Israel. It's almost like the Madkhali ideology was perfectly designed by the enemies of Islam to weaken the Ummah and divide the Ummah as much as possible. Well, as the famous expression goes, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, and there are official government documents confirming that it is indeed a duck, it's probably a duck. There is so much more that can be said about Madkhalis, but ultimately, they are a self-destructing group. They are notorious for cannibalizing each other and for infighting. And that's really why I feel bad for Sajid. My warning to you, Sajid, is that the Madkhalis will eventually turn on you if they haven't done so already. They will turn on you and demand that you change your dawah. The problem is that you have a lot of videos on your channel criticizing liberalism, feminism, and LGBT. You have videos that actually criticize US politicians for promoting these ideologies. These are things that secular dictators in the Muslim world are working hard to spread in the Muslim lands. When you speak against these ideologies in your videos, even if you don't mention any specific ruler, even if you don't indirectly allude to any specific ruler, that's still going to be considered a threat. And the Madkhalis will come after you. Again, maybe they're already pressuring you. They'll probably tell you something like, oh, don't focus so much on feminism or liberalism or atheism. That's all philosophy and philosophy is haram. Just focus on aqidah, focus on Quran and sunnah. Don't get involved in discussing these innovative matters. Don't get involved with debates against atheists or feminists. That's probably going to be the Madkhali message to you, Sajid, in the future. 
And they have already been in the process of evolving to this point where any criticism of liberalism is now in their crosshairs. This is why I believe the Madkhalis have turned up the dial on me and Muhammad Hijab and other du'at in the West who are critiquing liberalism and feminism and democratic representationalism. They see us as a threat because increasingly Muslims in the Middle East understand English and are watching and reading our material. If anti-secular, anti-liberal views become more popular, this becomes a big problem for these governments who are trying very hard to convert their Muslim populations into secular, pro-LGBT, pro-feminist liberals. In the end, I invite you, Brother Sajid, to have a conversation about these issues. Let's have a dialogue. You have my number. You can contact me at any time and we can easily set something up to openly discuss these issues. But if you're not willing to discuss openly and prefer to make a video response, then I have some questions that I insist that you address. I would really like to get your answers to the following questions. First, if criticism of rulers leads to bloodshed, then why doesn't your history criticizing U.S. social policy and criticizing U.S. government officials like Ilhan Omar count as a security threat? Number two, if you're so concerned about bloodshed, what about the bloodshed from two decades of the global war on terror and CVE policies that are applied in Muslim countries? These countering violent extremism policies have been used to kill and imprison countless Muslims for opposing secular governance on the basis that those Muslims are dangerous Kharijis who should be considered terrorists and extremists. Do you have any concern for that bloodshed? Third, there are around 50 or so Muslim countries in the world. Do we have to obey all 50 of those rulers and refrain from criticizing any of them? How is it possible to do that when these countries often disagree with each other and when even the rulers of these countries are engaged in criticizing other rulers of other countries? How should we decide which rulers should be obeyed and which rulers should not be criticized? Number four, here is a hypothetical. If soldiers came to a Muslim's house under orders from the ruler to sexually assault his wife and murder his children, if the Muslim father says, no, don't do this to my family, does that count as khuruj and inciting rebellion? Number five, imagine there is a Muslim ruler who says, I am a Muslim, but I'm going to force every Muslim in my country to renounce Islam and become an atheist. Is it permissible for Muslims to publicly criticize the ruler for that? Finally, what do you have to say about Sheikh Al-Albani and his public criticism of Saudi? Is Sheikh Al-Albani a Khariji? Is Sheikh Al-Albani inciting bloodshed? I would like Sajid and any other Madkhali to answer these simple questions. These are questions no Muslim should have any trouble answering. It's only the bizarre, deviant ideology of the Madkhalis that complicates such simple, obvious issues. May Allah rectify our affairs. If you would like more in-depth refutations of the Madkhali virus, I have linked some important references and videos in the description. Check them out and share them widely.